doesn't like petty texts, celebrity gossip, dating advice, spicy song lyrics, or just controversial opinions in general. Now imagine all that, but it's historical. In this podcast, we'll be reading some juicy historical letters, diaries, articles, and other piping hot tea. So get yourself something to drink and let's jump into textury. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Textory. Today we are going to jump in time straight to the glorious 1950s in the US, the land of possibilities, Chevrolets, drive-in cinemas, determined housewives, quickly developing suburbs, and finally, a plethora of fascinating inventions. So obviously this is an idealized version of the US that I have in my brain and I think it's because when I think about stories of my grandparents' youth, the stories are completely different. Poland at the time was not doing great. It was poor. Politically, it was very rough. A lot of people were getting imprisoned. Those that fought during the war were getting imprisoned and tortured and killed. People would denounce their neighbors. Straight up, you could come home and your husband would not be there because he was taken away and you'd never see him again. And uh, he probably perished somewhere in the Soviet Union, but you'll never know that. Obviously, people were not well off. We didn't have all of the amazing inventions, fridges, all that stuff. The whole American idea of consumerism and advertising and marketing, it must have felt very foreign to people coming from Poland because it was a different kind of advertising world here. And even though you did see ads for certain things, you would never get them anyway because there would be like two TVs thrown into the shop and there would be a queue of hundreds of people and uh, the two TVs would go to the government officials who knew they were coming and they um, kind of took them for themselves. So pretty bad time, completely different to the American myth of the glorious 50s where everything was going great. You know, the idea of families living in suburbs, the housewife staying in and cooking for the children and the husband, he's coming back from corporal work. Uh, He has a leather suitcase, they're watching Lucille Ball together, you know, completely foreign to me. So this is why I find it so fascinating and so interesting, because it's just something that I don't know from stories. Like, I don't know what it actually looked like, I can only look at the photos and and home videos from that time. Obviously there were communities and, and groups of people in the US that were also doing very poorly at the time. I feel like poverty is in general universal. So uh, some experiences are, of course, shared. But simple things like having food in your fridge, like jello. Can you imagine a person from Poland in the 50s getting jello in a package? The whole neighborhood would be there to try it. Poland, I would say, idolized USA a lot during that time because it was like this free land where people had all of the stuff that we didn't. It just seemed perfect, not having to worry about your neighbor denouncing you and, and then also having a fridge that is full of food and, and can you can make jello. There were a lot of people fantasizing about that. Reading diaries from the era, it seems like all people wanted was to live in the US. And also part of that was all of the inventions. Like at the time, it seemed that the US was a land of possibilities. There were new designs and patents all of the time. And fair, a lot of the innovative stuff that we use today was designed in the US in the 50s. Whether people had access to it is another story, but a lot of the things from that era we still use nowadays. So people could also see changes around them. And a lot of Americans probably felt that maybe success is just around the corner because your uncle just came up with another invention, he patented it and, you know, he became a millionaire. So a lot of people had that mindset where so many things were popping up, so many improvements, so many inventions, so many designs. Like you probably have seen this video of a 1950s fridge that was just full of secret hidden options, like a a separate butter compartment, all that stuff. A lot of genius ideas that over time, I guess they were just not viable to 
to make anymore. But but a lot of those emerged in the 50s. And I think the general mindset of the of the American population was we're improving our lives. We're using electricity. We're using machines. We're using all sorts of improvements to make our lives faster and easier, to make cooking and cleaning and taking care of the home easier. And I guess also that's why regular people started coming up with designs and ideas. So where all this is heading is, (laughs) today we'll be looking at the American magazine. This is a magazine that was published in the US until 1956. And the magazine is mostly family stuff or just... uh, It's a lifestyle magazine, I would say. It's trying to keep a balance between being uh, for housewives versus being for the husbands. There is some articles about traveling. There is articles on cooking. There is articles like how to get along with mothers-in-law. But mostly there is a lot of short stories and most of them are romance stories that are really nicely illustrated. So I'm assuming it was mostly for women. But if a husband stole the magazine, he would not be that disappointed. And in the the American magazine, there was this column that was people sending in prompts for new designs, new improvements, new inventions. The column was called Why Don't They? And it was mostly housewives, I think, because most of these are married women, sending in ideas for inventions that they think could be useful in their regular lives or something that is bugging them that could be improved. A lot of these are really interesting, I think. So uh, we're going to have a look at some of the selected ideas that I found. This is the American Magazine volume 149, number one, from 1950. Also, it's interesting because they paid for those ideas, but it wasn't great money. And I wonder if by submitting the ideas, uh, you were also getting rid of the rights to the ideas. And if someone then used the ideas, because that would suck. But it doesn't say much about that. It only does say that they were paid $5. But I'm, I'm just thinking like... I hope someone didn't use this concept to come up with with a patent that they would then earn millions on. Well, let's have a look at some of these. So why don't they print snapshots on adhesive-backed paper covered with a thin protecting film? Remove the film and the photograph would be ready for permanent placement in an album. That was uh, Marjorie Spees from Forest City. Honestly, genius. I know that we can now print photographs on whatever we want, but back then albums were definitely more popular than they are now, and just photographs in like a physical format. So why not make them stickers? We obviously can print um, photos now on sticker paper, but this is actually genius. Another idea. Why don't they invent buy the slice bread machines for use in grocery stores? Set a dial to the number and kind of slices you want, press a button and out pops your package selection. This was Mrs. Donald Quinlan from Fresno. I feel like that kind of is a thing now. Like, we definitely can slice the bread, but the number of the slices is something completely else. And this would actually be very useful for everyone that lives alone and only needs, like, a couple of slices a day. And then the bread gets moldy if they buy a bigger one, and then it's a mess, and then it's uh, a waste. So this is actually not stupid at all. What I find interesting about this is the the way people thought about inventions was affected by what sort of inventions came out at the time. So if we watch a science fiction films nowadays, we usually see some sort of touch screens or they always do those like levitating <laughs> touch screens that they enhance and and do all and move around. Back then it was all lit up buttons and dials and numbers and all that stuff. So this is interesting because it affects the way they thought the things could work. So she invented a a buy the slice bread machine, but she also thought that you would need to dial a number of the slices and then press a button and all that stuff. So I find this really interesting. Why don't they produce blankets with box pleats for fat people and curled up sleepers and so eliminate blanket snatching? Mrs. Walter Luce. This is one of my (laughs) favorites. I think it may not work actually because I'm assuming the more pleated the blanket would be, the hotter it would be, maybe. But uh, this is such a fun idea for anyone that struggles with with blanket snatching, as Mrs. Walter Luce put it. (laughs) But also, 
yay for inclusivity, you know, just make expandable blankets for, for fat people that, that maybe the regular blanket would not be enough for them. Why don't they design a glove with a replaceable strip of sandpaper in the palm. After sewing a board, a quick rub with the glove would smooth it, thought Mrs. William Ellis from Colorado Springs. Is this not a thing? This should totally be a thing. I mean, I wonder about the effectiveness of just rubbing a glove around a, a raw wood piece, but also, no, it has to be a thing. Let me Google it. Sand paper gloves. Amazon has peel and stick sanding single glove set. Glove with replaceable sandpaper. Okay, that's basically it. Someone definitely stole that idea. <laughs> but because it's on Amazon and it's not like all over the place when I Google it, I'm assuming it's probably not that popular. Probably easier to just uh, use a sandpaper that is not a part of, <laughs> of your hand. Why don't they perfect a telephone with dual mouthpiece and receiver so mother and child can talk to father at the same time? Mrs. Lawrence G. Roth from Rochester. I feel like we could still work on this because <laughs> what the hell is going on during all those Zoom meetings or just calls when there is more than two people involved? I feel like the microphones just go a little crazy. But I guess this one is more for like, you didn't have speakers in telephones, obviously, so to hear the person that is talking to you, you had to hold a receiver in your ear, and that's obviously making it difficult for people to hear uh, what's going on. That I feel like we took care of, like, uh, even uh, not, not, not that much later, there were already, like, different telephone lines. Uh, let's move on to the American Magazine, volume 152, number 3, from 1951. Why don't they paint all fire trucks, ambulances, and other emergency apparatus with new fluorescent paint so that they will be easily visible at night? Mrs. C.E. Merritt from Klamath Falls. I feel like we kind of do that now. It, obviously, it's just stripes, but all of the emergency vehicles are painted with fluorescent paint or at least have like sticker on elements to make it easier to to see them especially ambulances i feel like had that feature where they're like just all around very fluorescent but what i find interesting is that fluorescent paint was new at the time and i feel like it's it's one of the only cases of colors that didn't exist before or like were l rarely seen by people. Someone in 19th century never saw fluorescent orange or pink. Someone in Victorian London never got to see that color. Because even when you have vibrant flowers or just some other natural pigments, I feel like it's still nowhere near, let's say, fluorescent highlighters. And I find that crazy to think that people that lived a hundred years ago never saw fluorescent colors. But what's also crazy is that she wanted the paint to cover all of them, I think, because there is an illustration in the magazine and obviously it's kind of like a humorous drawing, but the whole thing is glowing, basically. So I feel like maybe safety-wise it's not the best idea, but otherwise, why don't they devise sets of mechanical feet to be installed in shoe stores, which could be used to break in new shoes for customers? This one's by Rosa Packer from Saginaw, Michigan? Never mind. Um, yeah, why don't they? <laughs> what the hell? This one is definitely something we could use nowadays because especially leather is so difficult to break. Like I have a pair of sandals from like 20, oh, 2019 even, I think. And they're just impossible to wear. Like every time I try, I end up in immense pain. Let me just say that. And it's not worth it. So why don't they devise a set of mechanical feet? I wonder like how long would the breaking in take? Because I'm assuming it would have to be like thousands of movements that the mechanical feet would have to make for the shoes to be broken in. And also what sort of mold would be used for the mechanical feet because every feet is different. And that's what's annoying about breaking in new shoes is that something that would not be an issue for someone else is suddenly an issue for you you. I have several spots in my feet that are just weird. So I guess technically it could be difficult, but also, you know, we've come so far. Let's just make mechanical feet to break in new shoes. <laughs> Why don't they impregnate disposable paper sheets with commercial cleansers for handy use in bathtub scouring? This is by Mrs. Roy E. Nickel from Hamilton. Okay, this one I decided to talk about because we basically do nowadays. 
So a lot of these ideas, I'm assuming, were thought of by a lot of people and uh, and they ended up being patented because I definitely have limescale cleanser infused sheets that I use for uh, cleaning my bathtub. So a lot of these, I'm like, oh my god, we do have it now, but... And back in 1951, it was still just a crazy idea that someone had and, and it had to be invented. Let's move on to uh, to volume 153 of the American Magazine, issue number two from 1952. Why don't they install mower blades between the rear wheels of a tricycle so Junior could cut the grass while playing in the yard? <laughs> This one's by Linda Lackey from Junction. This one just made me laugh so hard because, oh my god, genius. But also, this is asking for an accident. <laughs> I can imagine Junior figuring out that when he plays on his tricycle in the yard, the grass mis mysteriously disappears and he would be interested in what is making it go. And he would probably try and pick out the grass himself and then lose all of his fingers. So, yes, but also... Let's maybe not go there. But, you know, this is very efficient use of children playing. Why don't they cut wedges of ice cream in the restaurants for pie a la mode since bowls don't behave well under a fork? R.W. Aretz from Waconia. Oh my god, this one, when I read it, I was like, why have we not thought of this? Like, why do we still serve ice cream in scoops? When it's so clear that when we use a, a spoon, well, in this case, he's saying a fork, but whatever, when we use cutlery, it just keeps sliding on my plate and then I end up with melting half of it be before I even manage to, to cut a piece off. Why don't they serve it in, like, a more ergonomical shape? Like, just cut the edges off or just, I don't know, do anything else but a scoop or a ball. This is genius. Why don't they attach a thermostatic device to the telephone to warn the phone company if a fire breaks out while occupants of a home are out? Mrs. E. Schuster from Tulsa. This one also so great, pretty easy to install and could save so many potential properties. Maybe it should actually call the emergency services though and not the phone company because I can assume the phone company being like, oh god, not another fire. But just sort of like an alarm feature in the telephone and pretty much every American home that could afford it had a telephone. So why not use it for something actually useful when you're out of the house? Why don't they build battery operated lamps in women's purses to light up when the bag is opened. This one's by Eva Waldo from Ida Grove. This is kind of genius, but also what situation would you use that in? Like in the car or... I mean, yes, it is annoying not to be able to find something in your purse, but also when are you in total darkness? <laughs> like, what sort of situation would that be used in? Why don't they make people learning to drive in traffic hang a warning sign on their automobile? E.W. Nippo from New York. They do now. There is definitely signs about being a student driver. It's either the L sign or, or just a massive yellow sign. But we definitely came up with that because of that same reason. Like, it's just better to know that someone maybe is not well versed in the, <laughs> in the car um, savoir vivre yet. I can imagine in the 50s there were a lot less cars and they were driving a little slower. But still, it must have been annoying not to know who actually knows how to drive when you were in the streets. I thought that was a standard, but it must have become a standard later. Why don't they invent an umbrella whose handle comes down from the tip of a rib to keep the center unobstructed and allow clearer view, uh, says Herbert Buto from Chicago. This is the one I would 100% buy and invest my money in because somehow when I'm holding the umbrella it's always dripping on my arm. Like, it's always dripping on my shoulder. And I feel like this maybe could have eliminated that issue. But then, if the handle is on the side, then that's even worse. I wonder if anyone ever came up with that. Like, if anyone actually tried inventing that and, and checked if it actually works. Uh, let's move on to the American Magazine, volume 154. And the issue number is number 6 from 1952. Why don't they 
Invent a combination automatic clothes washer and dryer for those who want both appliances but have room for only one, says Mrs. Wilfred J. Carr from Waldwick. Mrs. Wilfred, boy do I have news for you. Guess what's in my kitchen right now? I have a washer and a dryer in, a, in one machine precisely for that reason. I just didn't have enough room for separate ones. And I think most people don't have room for separate ones because something that Mrs. Wilfred was maybe not aware of at the time or didn't imagine it happening was how much less space we would have per person now than they used to have in the 1950s, which is a little sad but also I guess kind of resourceful and considering how many people have been born since then and how much the population has expanded is kind of unavoidable too. Why don't they manufacture cotton blankets, wool is too scratchy, with sleeves in one end for people who like to read in bed on cold winter nights? Mrs. Frank A. Bogart from Omaha says... This is, again, definitely something that exists. I've seen people have blankets with sleeves, but this is really cute because it is annoying when you're under a blanket and you're trying to read or you're on your phone because that's the case most of the time. And my elbows and my arms are still freezing and I'm like, how do I keep my arms under the blanket but also keep the device or the book in my hands? And this would actually do it. <laughs> like, this is actually a solution. Also a little sad that her first thought was either cotton or wool, whereas nowadays finding a cotton or wool blanket is A, impossible, B, super expensive. Why don't they devise a rubberized feeding spoon whose pliable edge would protect a baby's mouth and tender skin, says Mrs. Eleanor M. Forbes from Fresno. They do now. This is one of those that, again, I'm assuming a lot of mothers complain about how using just a regular silver spoon hurts the baby and is annoying to use. And uh, we definitely have plastic and, and rubber feeding spoons now that are very soft and, and, as she said, protect a baby's mouth. Why don't they issue gift certificates at auto service stations so one could make a present of gasoline, oil, tires or lubrication service for the hard-to-buy gift for a car owner, <laughs> says Mrs. E.F. Yates Jr. from Norfolk. Okay, I will admit I don't have a car and before reading this I actually did not know that we do now have gift cards that offer you to buy gas or just gift cards for gas stations. So again, one of the ideas that probably a lot of people at the time were wondering why it's not a thing yet and then it became a thing and is still used nowadays. So again, it's something that probably emerged in the 1950s with people getting more and more cars. And this was the last one of the ideas that people had for the why don't they column in the American magazine in the 1950s. And I think it's super interesting how a lot of these ideas we either came up with or wouldn't mind coming up with. And then some of them are just like, Okay, um, <laughs> sure getting your kid on a tricycle that is also equipped with blades is a great idea. But it's also interesting, and I wonder if that kind of also affects us nowadays, is how invested those people were in improving their lives. Like, people had a problem in their daily life and they were like, what can I do to make this problem go? Like, how can I improve this? How can we collectively think of a solution to this problem? And nowadays I feel like we love to complain about things, but actually coming up with a solution is a very rare occurrence and is reserved for startups or, or people that are looking for business ideas. But just a regular person that spends a lot of time in their house or garden nowadays, I can't think of the last time I thought of an, an improvement to my environment. Like, I can't think of the last time when I was like, actually, I can fix it doing this. So it's this mindset that I think is something that has faded a little bit since then. And it's obviously also an effect of, uh, you know, that mindset was a product of its era. And people were surrounded with so many ads concerning new inventions that it was constantly on their mind and and also they knew stories of regular housewives and regular people coming up with those inventions and then succeeding so they were definitely more encouraged to even think about those solutions but also I think that nowadays we just don't have the time like we just notice something that annoys us as we're making breakfast and then we curse and then uh, we drink our coffee and we go 
it's definitely one of the reasons why I sometimes say that um, just because we are more modern and just because we kept changing things doesn't mean we changed them for the better because a lot of inventions we actually changed for worse <laughs> and those ideas are slowly coming back and it kind of infuriates me when I see something that was definitely a thing in like the 50s and 60s coming back now as a kickstarter idea because I'm like what do you mean reusable tissues like Tissues were reusable for thousands of years. It's only the last 50 years that we started using the paper ones. So yes, a lot of the improvements that we implemented are actually bad for the environment or just straight up not comfortable for us. And it's gonna take a while for us to realize that and go, and go back to what was already invented, which is ridiculous, but uh, to end it on a positive note, a lot of these ideas didn't stand the test of time or uh, because of the computers, because of new technologies, they're, they're just redundant now. So I guess it's just a different idea of development and a different idea of um, problem solving and uh, coming up with solutions to, to everyday problems. So uh, I'm not saying one is worse than the other. I'm just saying it's completely different. That's what I think at least. So um, we're gonna end here and I'll see you again in another episode of Text Tree. Thank you, bye.